Welcome everyone to the Apotheki Tales, the basics of pharmacology. Today we'll be talking about the remaining drugs used in the treatment of epilepsy. So in the first part of the video, we had discussed about the drugs such as the benzodiazepine, carbamazepine, eslicarbazepine, ethosuximide, isogabin, felbamate, gabapentin, lacosamide and lamotrigin. So we'll be talking about the remaining drugs in this video. So the next drug is the levetiracetam. The exact mechanism of the anticonvulsant action is unknown and it demonstrates high affinity for a synaptic vesicle protein that is SV2A. And this protein is responsible for regulating the neurotransmitter release. So when this drug goes and binds to this protein, the chances of the neurotransmitter being released is reduced. And this is mainly used for the adjunct therapy of local onset, myoclonic seizures and primary generalized tonic-clonic seizures in adults and children. The drug is usually well absorbed orally and excreted in urine mostly unchanged resulting in few to no drug interactions. The levetiracetam can cause the mood alterations that may require a dose reduction or a change of medication. The next drug is oxcarbacepine. So this is actually a prodrug that is being rapidly reduced to the 10 monohydroxy metabolite that is responsible for its anticonvulsant activity. Now this 10 monohydroxy metabolite is blocking the sodium channels preventing the spread of the abnormal discharge. It is also thought to modulate the calcium channels. It is approved for the use in adults and children with the partial onset seizures. Now this oxcarbacepine is a less potent inducer of the cytochrome 3A4 and UGT than the carbamazepine. The adverse effect of the hyponatremia limits its use in the elderly population. Next is the perim panel. This is a selective alpha amino 3 hydroxy 5 methyl 4 isooxazole propionic acid antagonist which results in reducing the excitatory activity. So what is this AMPA? This is a compound that is a specific agonist for the AMPA receptor where it mimics the effects of the neurotransmitter glutamate. So we know that the neurotransmitter glutamate is excitatory neurotransmitter. So this is parambanol is an antagonist which will act on the particular receptor and thereby reduces the excitatory activity. The parambanol has a long half-life enabling once daily dosing and it is approved for the adjunctive therapy of partial onset seizures in patients 12 years or older. Perum panel is a newer anti-epileptic agent and the limited data are available in patients. Next is the phenobarbital and primadone. Now this primadone drug gets metabolized to the phenobarbital which is the major conversion and along with the phenyl ethyl malonamide both with anticonvulsant activity. So in particular, the phenobarbital is responsible for the enhancement of the inhibitory effects of GABA-mediated neurons. So we know this GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now this phenobarbital is used primarily in the treatment of status epilepticus when other agents fail. Next drugs is the phenytoin and phosphenytoin. Phenytoin usually blocks the voltage-gated sodium channels by selectively binding to the channel in the inactive state and thereby slowing its rate of recovery. It is effective for the treatment of focal as well as generalized tonic-clonic seizures and in the treatment of status epilepticus. Phenytoin induces the drugs metabolized by the cytochrome P2C and cytochrome P3 a families and the UGT enzyme system. Phenytoin usually exhibits a saturable enzyme metabolism resulting in the non-linear pharmacokinetic properties. So what does it mean that uh, it is showing a non-linear pharmacokinetic because of the saturable enzyme metabolism? That means if you try to increase the amount of the daily dose uh, in a small proportion also, it can produce a larger increase in the plasma concentration which will further result in the drug-induced toxicity. 
that means by a small increase in the daily dose of the phenytoin the enzyme uh, system available for the metabolism of the phenytoin gets easily saturable as a result it leads to a larger increase in the plasma concentration resulting in the drug induced toxicity depression of the cns occurs particularly in the cerebellum and vestibular system causing nystagmus and ataxia the elderly are highly susceptible to this effect gingival hyperplasia may cause the gums to grow over the teeth long term use may lead to development of peripheral neuropathies and osteoporosis although phenytoin is advantageous due to its low cost the actual cost of therapy may be much higher considering the potential for serious toxicity and adverse effects now we talk about the phosphenetoin so what is the difference of phosphenetoin from phenytoin phosphenetoin is a pro drug that is rapidly converted to phenytoin in the blood within minutes phosphenetoin may be administered intramuscularly phenytoin sodium should never be given intramuscularly as it causes the tissue damage and necrosis phosphenetoin is the drug of choice and standard of care for iv and I am administration of the phenytoin so that is when we have to give a patient phenytoin in the either in the route of IM or IV we should usually prefer the phosphenytoin because of sound alike and look alike trade names there is a risk for prescribing errors for instance the trade name of phosphenytoin is cerebix which is easily confused with celebrex the cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor as well as celexa the antidepressant The next drug is the pregabalin. Pregabalin usually binds to the alpha 2 omega site which is an auxiliary subunit of voltage gated calcium channels in the CNS which inhibits the excitatory neurotransmitter release. So that means this pregabalin will bind to this particular site of the voltage gated calcium channel in the CNS and inhibits the excitatory neurotransmitter release. So thereby the neurotransmitter is not getting released and the action potential or the neurotransmission does not occur. the exact role this plays in treatment is not known but the drug has proven effects on focal onset seizures diabetic peripheral neuropathy post herpetic neuralgia and fibromyalgia more than 90% of the pregabalin is eliminated renally therefore what is required the dosage adjustments are needed in the renal dysfunction it has no significant metabolism and few drug interactions are only present weight gain and peripheral edema have been reported the next one is the rufenamide this rufenamide acts at the sodium channels and it is approved for the adjunctive treatment of seizures associated with lennox gastro syndrome in children over the age of 4 years and in adults rufenamide is a weak inhibitor of the cytochrome p 2e1 and a weak inducer of cytochrome p 3a4 enzymes Remember the food increases the absorption and the peak serum concentrations. Serum concentrations of this rufenamide are affected by other anti-epilepsy medications. It is induced by carbamazepine and phenytoin and inhibited when given with valproate. Adverse effects usually include the potential for short-term QT intervals. Therefore keep in mind the patients with familial short QT syndrome should not be treated with rufenamide. The next drug is tiagabin. So this is usually blocking the GABA uptake into presynaptic neurons permitting more GABA to be available for receptor binding and therefore it enhances inhibitory activity. Tiagabin is effective as adjunctive treatment in partial onset seizures and in the post marketing surveillance seizures have occurred in patients using the tiagabin who did not have epilepsy. So remember tiagabin should not be used for indications other than epilepsy. Next is topiramate. So this topiramate has got multiple mechanisms of action. It blocks the voltage dependent uh, sodium channels it reduces the high voltage calcium currents that is of l type it is a carbonic and hydrase inhibitor and may act at glutamate and nmda sites now the stopramate is effective for use in partial and primary generalized seizures it is also approved for 
prevention of migraine. It inhibits the cytochrome P2C19 and is induced by phenytoin and carbamazepine. The adversaries usually include the somnolence, weight loss and parasitias as well as the renal stones, glaucoma, oligohydrosis and hyperthermia has also been reported. Next is the valproic acid and divalproic. So the possible mechanisms of action include the sodium channel blockade, blockade of GABA transaminase and action at the T type calcium channel. So what is the role of the GABA transaminase? It is the enzyme that is responsible for the metabolism of the GABA neurotransmitter. So when we block the enzyme, what happens? The metabolism of the GABA does not occur. So more amount of the GABA is available, thereby causes the inhibitory neurotransmission. So this varied mechanisms usually provide a broad spectrum of activity against the seizures. It is effective for the treatment of focal and primary generalized seizures. Valproic acid is usually available as a free acid. Divalproic sodium is a combination of the sodium valproate and valproic acid that is converted to the valproate when it reaches the gastrointestinal tract. It was developed to improve the gastrointestinal tolerance of valproic acid. So all of the available salt forms are equivalent in efficacy. Commercial products are available in multiple salt dosage forms and extended release formulations. Therefore, the risk for medication errors is high and it is essential to be familiar with all the preparations. Valproate inhibits the metabolism of cytochrome P2C9, UGT and epoxide hydrolase systems. Rare hepatotoxicity may cause a rise in liver enzymes which should be monitored frequently. Teratogenicity is also of great concern with the valproate or divalproates. Next is vigabatrin. Vigabatrin usually acts as an irreversible inhibitor of the GABA transaminase. So we have already mentioned what is the role of the enzyme which is responsible for the metabolism of the GABA. Now this vigabatrin is associated with visual field loss ranging from mild to severe in 30% or more of patients. Vigabatrin is only available through physicians and pharmacies that participate in the restricted distribution share program. Next drug is the zonosamide. So the zonosamide is a sulfonamide derivative that has a broad spectrum of action. The common has multiple effects including the blockade of both voltage-gated sodium channels and T-type calcium currents. It has a limited amount of carbonic anhydrase activity. Zonosamide is approved for the use in patients with focal epilepsy. It is metabolized by the cytochrome P3A4 isozyme and may to a lesser extent may be affected by the cytochrome P3A5 and cytochrome P2C19. In addition to the typical CNS adverse effects, the zonosamide may cause the kidney stones. Oligohydrosis has been reported and the patient should be monitored for the increased body temperature and decreased sweating. Zonosamide is usually contraindicated in patients with sulfonamide or carbonic anhydrase inhibitor hypersensitivity. So these are the different drugs that can be used in the treatment of epilepsy. So now we'll just go for a quick recap of the various drugs, its mechanism of action, half-life and all.
earlier understood regarding the different drugs that is used in the treatment of epilepsy. Now, before winding up this topic of epilepsy, I would like to talk about one small topic that is the status epilepticus. So, the status epilepticus usually where the two or more seizures may occur without recovery of full consciousness in between the episodes. This may be focal or primary, generalized, convulsive or non-convulsive. Status epilepticus is usually life-threatening and requires emergency treatment usually consisting of administration of a fast-acting medication such as the benzodiazepine followed by a slower-acting medication such as phenytoin. So I hope I have covered the important sections that may be helping you with this topic of epilepsy. So if there's any doubts and comments, please do mail in us. Thank you.